Welcome to Econ 102, where economist Noah Smith and I make sense of what's happening in the news, technology, business, and beyond through the lens of economics. Let's jump right in. Hello, sir. Hey. Welcome back from Poland. Thank you. Good to be back. You, are you feeling better? Not entirely better, no. Hope the doctors went okay? Yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, I hear you. Cool. We have a big episode today. Shall we, shall we get to it? Let's do it. Awesome. Um, I, th I thought we'd start because we have a couple questions there on, on fracking. Maybe, maybe as a high level, you write in your piece about how fracking makes sense policy-wise. It makes sense politically, which sort of begs the question, why was it ever unpopular among the left? Were those things not true you know, a few years ago? Or what's sort of the, the history there? Well, so, I mean, there, I think there's a number of things. Why was it not popular among the left? Because, uh, I mean, what is, what is popular among the left? Anyway, the left in the, in the late 2010s was really sort of feeling their oats. You know, they had had the, the success of the Bernie Sanders campaign in almost defeating Hillary, but not, not quite in 2016. They felt like it was really their time. And the enthusiasm for things like Democratic Socialists of America, for you know various activist groups, and for the Sunrise Movement, the environmentalist sort of new vanguard of the environmentalist movement, and so you know they they started proposing these really extremely big bold policies. So so the Green New Deal was part of that, and they that sort of went nowhere, but they were undaunted. And so so the next idea was a fracking ban. In fact, some states did ban fracking. Now. Fracking was was a relatively new thing, you know, hydraulic fracturing. It's, you know, you pump water into rock to break it apart so that the, the gas bubbles out and you can capture the gas. Or the oil bubbles out and you can capture the oil in the case of um, shale oil, tight oil, as they call it. So it was new. And, you know, America is a rich country and a, a very rich country where people, you know, often spend a lot of effort trying to prevent any new thing from happening. There's no one's going to admit it, but what, what's really going on in people's minds is anything that changes would make things worse because things are actually pretty good. And so, you know, fracking has an negative environmental effects. You know, it has, it creates runoff, you know, chemical runoff that can, you know, pollute water if you if you don't like try to catch the runoff or control it, et cetera. Fracking can cause minor earthquakes, which it, as far as we know, it can't cause like a damaging earthquake, but it can shake the ground a little sometimes because escaping gas can shake the ground and cause things to slip and slide around. And so that, that can scare people, you know, it's never actually damaged anything. And finally, you know, fracking, it is a fossil fuel, right? Gas is a fossil fuel, oil is of course a fossil fuel and fracking, you know, releases methane, methane, when you crack the rock open, methane bubbles up at various places, not just around where you, where you suck the, the, the gas out of the ground, but other places too. And so I think that it seemed like you could list these downsides of it and it was something new, right? And then, and then along comes the left really feeling their sort of newfound power and, you know, the climate left. And so the idea was let's, let's ban it. Let's just, Americans like to ban thing, ban new things because new things are new. And if you're rich and you ban new things, are you really that bad off? So it was a degrowth kind of thing. And so, some people banned, you know, some states banned fracking, states without really any fracking, right? Like fracking is very concentrated in certain states, and those states want it for economic reasons, Pennsylvania and Texas and, and places like that. And then states that didn't have any fracking banned it. So you got some fracking bans. Also, I think the name sound, fracking sounds like something harsh and strange. Anyway, that was stupid. I mean, it's fine to ban fracking in areas where you don't have fracking, like you're not actually hurting anything. But the idea of banning fracking throughout the country which was floated by people and was even briefly embraced by Kamala Harris in 2019 was that was a stupid idea because a environmentally it was dumb because natural gas emits a lot less carbon per you know BTU of energy than coal does and natural gas has been steadily replacing coal and this is why America's carbon emissions have dropped now of course fracking emits methane which is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon but stays in the atmosphere only a few years you know it, it falls out pretty quick as opposed to carbon dioxide, which stays there for, you know, the rest of our lives. And, but methane falls out pretty quick. Also, there's ways to sort of control and capture, you know, methane. It's, it's a lot easier than, than carbon dioxide. And so really it was just, it was a net positive in terms of climate to, to you to switch from coal to gas 
which and in gas we got by fracking. That's how you, that's how you do it. And and then also geopolitically, you know, it turned out that that letting Russia and and Saudi Arabia and Iran sort of control world oil supplies was probably a bad idea. The United States has more oil than any of those guys, and yet we can only get it out by fracking. And so we finally realized that leaving all the oil drilling in the world to those folks was probably not a good idea. And yeah, so basically, I think during, you know, in, in, in 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine and oil prices spiked, the Biden administration is like, okay, you know what? The whole idea of fracking, limiting fracking, whatever, it's gone, done, put a fork in it. Because people were already starting to realize that, the, that it just wasn't a great idea on its own, you know, on the environmental or economic merits. But I think the fact that you added this geopolitical factor to it just totally killed the idea of, of uh, fracking ban. And so Biden really started to just grant fracking leases on federal lands at a rate faster than Trump did and, and really just went whole hog with fracking. You know, for because once once you decide that you know that that squeezing fracking to death is not a thing you want to do, then you want to just allow as much of it as you can. And so so the United States became the now produces more oil than any country in world history ever, and we also and exports like we became a net oil exporter, and we brought oil prices back down through that method. And also we fracked so much gas that we ended up shipping a lot of it to Europe and Europe was able to get off Russian gas, which was, which was good for them. It saved their economies uh, of the European countries from really being crushed. So it turned into this huge success. And I think that Harris should run on that success. There's, there's been this relatedly, there's this writer, Alex Epstein and a few other writers who, who write books about, you know, the moral case for fossil fuels and how we need more fossil fuels, which is sort of contradictory to how people have been thinking about things for the last decade. Are you kind of in your spirit of abundance, like we need more of all of it? We just we need to use more energy. We need more fossil fuels. We need more renewables. You know, just the more of everything, the better. How would you add more nuance to, to that perspective? Well, the thing is that, that as renewables get cheaper, we'll use less fossil fuels because of substitution. You know, already coal is kind of vanishing as a thing because fossil fuel technology, you know, fracking is new, but, but fracking is not cheaper than oil drilling through the traditional method was 100 years ago, right? Oil drilling, essentially one thing you notice with, with technologies that involve digging things up out of the ground is that there's no learning curve. Essentially, you can technological innovation will continue to provide supply, but will not make mining significantly cheaper. So mining materials costs about the same amount as it ever did. That's a technological advance, but it's not gonna make it cheaper. But when you have something that can be built in a factory, like solar panel modules or, or components or wind turbines or things like that, or batteries especially, those things get cheaper over time. And they, they, that doesn't last forever, but, but it lasts for a long time. And, and it's still lasting now. So, so solar got insanely cheap. Solar panels are basically just like, you know, like they're, they're cheaper than junk now. They're a commodity. They're a... They're the com most commodity of commoditized products, like panels that will produce energy from the sun when you turn them to the sun are the most commodified thing. They're just insanely cheap. And the batteries to store energy overnight, you know, or through a storm or whatever, are insanely cheap now. They're getting insanely cheap. And so you see is Texas buying tons of this. But when Texas is buying a ton of something, uh, when Texas is buying a ton of non-fossil fuel energy, you know that it's it's not because of subsidies, right? It's not because of, um, it's not because of, you know, wokeness or politics or political, whatever. It's because that's the most, that's the most cost-effective thing. And if you look at China, they're now, China actually is slightly reducing its coal now, which is crazy because they've been, they were building so much new coal power. And yet now they're actually slightly reducing the amount, or at least, you know, this past year, of course, they have an economic slowdown as well, so they're not growing quite as fast as they did. So degrowth is, is somewhat of a factor there too. But the idea that we need to consciously try to use more fossil fuels is, is wrong. There's no reason to do that. When you use all the different types of energy, the types that can be built in a factory get cheaper than the other types because of human ingenuity in learning how to build things cheaper. And so over time, that means that that renewable energy will displace fossil fuels and it's already starting to happen.
and in, in some places it's actually pretty advanced. Like you see some some countries where renewables have almost completely displaced fossil fuels. That had some some help from policy. But basically, promoting renewables with subsidies is good because we we it's a bet on those learning curves, right? It's a bet on those scaling effects. It's a bet on those things getting even cheaper if you build even more of it. And so it's that's that's a good bet. So far, it's been a, it's been a perfect bet. It's never failed. But but it's a smart bet to make because when you subsidize that stuff, you're not just paying cheaper. You're not just paying lower prices today because of the subsidy. The scale up of that do you know will mean that you'll pay lower prices even without subsidies tomorrow. So that's why subsidies are for for renewable energy, like we have in the Inflation Reduction Act, are a good idea. It's because of those learning curves and scaling things. So even without you know banning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are going to go, they're not going to go away, but they're going to be a lot less prevalent than they are now. They were sort of a starter kit for civilization. Right. The, this relates to a question that I want to bring up from one of our listeners who basically says, okay, this is for Ben Fitz. And Ben says, your writing brought me up to date with incredible developments in solar and batteries, overturning my renewable energy skeptic priors but I still can't get at wind energy. Anything, everything that's exciting about solar and batteries, i.e. new chemistries, efficient mass production, exponential scaling, does not hold for wind. Wind is mechanical, expensive to scale, and unpredictable. Yes, I get that at higher latitudes in winter, solar drops and the wind blows more reliably, except sometimes it doesn't. What am I missing? One, one slight mistake there is that, that wind uh, does have scaling effects because you build the turbines in a factory. And so not only that, you also get some scaling effect from building a larger turbine. So we've been able to just build these things bigger and bigger and bigger until now they're the size of skyscrapers. And so that a bigger turbine is more efficient than a smaller turbine because it just loses less energy to friction and whatnot, catches more of the, more of the wind. And, and so, so those in wind does have a learning curve, both from building, you know, and, and it does have a scaling effect from sheer size and it has a learning curve from the fact that we build the turbines in a factory, right? Turbines are of that size are difficult to build and they get cheaper the more you do that, right? Now, that said, wind has lots of disadvantages that, uh, that you know, solar doesn't have. Wind takes much, much more land. Like wind takes far more land than solar. The biggest weakness of solar is nimbyism, is the idea that people say, well, don't build those ugly solar panels in my backyard, but then wind, you know, we'll take far more land than that. We'll have to take land away from grazing and from, you know, from farming and all kinds of things. And that requires much more transmission lines and transmission lines are subject to their own NIMBY problem. People are like, well, we don't build those power lines in my land, and, you know, or in where I can see them. I don't want to see those ugly power lines, things like that. So, so solar, you can build a lot closer to the, the sort of place where you use it. Wind has to be, you know, carried long distances. And these mean that, so, so wind is obviously important. You know, Texas is building tons of wind. Places are building lots of wind, but ultimately I think it's going to be a marginal, it, it's going to be a niche solution. It's going to be, wind is going to be like, you know, I don't know, I'm making things, numbers up obviously, but let's say wind would be like 10%, 15%, something like that of our, of our electricity mix. And in that sense, I liken it to nuclear power. I think nuclear power is, is you know, it's good. And, and there's certainly advantages that it has, some advantages that it has. It's more compact than a lot of things. You know, it's, it's very firm energy. With batteries, that's becoming less important, but it's still, it's still not zero important. And so, you know, you can, so, and, and then nuclear, you can also, if you're a state that needs to make nuclear weapons, you can use it for that. There's other benefits of nuclear, but ultimately I don't think nuclear is going to be more than like 15% of our electricity mix. And I think that if you look at China, they're building plenty of nuclear, but they're building a lot, much, much more of solar than of nuclear. So, you know, when people say nuclear is the answer, well, nuclear is going to be a niche product. It's going to be part of the, you know, so then if you have 15% from nuclear, 15% from wind and 50% from hydro, and then like 55% from solar, right, then there you go. Or let's say 50% from solar and 5% from natural gas. And then like that's, you know, then you've, basically decarbonize your whole your whole grid 95 percent of your grid got it so you're you're basically bullish that we're gonna we're gonna figure this out well yeah we, i mean we we have figured it out i think we you know there's it, it's all over except for the land use fights we we figured it out we know how to do this now of course there's 
there's the fact that new demands for electricity from AI and uh, stuff are going to, you know, big, big hungry data centers. That's going to, that's going to slow down decarbonization because it's going to suck up new energy for, for these new products. Yeah. Peter Thiel actually had this theory that he shared recently where he thinks that the reason or one reason why nuclear power plants were so slow or why we made them so difficult to, to build was because we were scared of the potential connection or adjacencies to nuclear weapons. And thus we, you know, deliberately slowed them down to uh, prevent the risk of, of us or others, you know, obtaining nukes in a, in a similar way. That's obviously true. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, there was that there's, there's people's just fear of, of nuclear stuff of radiation, you know, this invisible, silent death thing, people scared of it. Yeah, there's, you know, nuclear waste and, and nuclear accidents, and people are, are, you know, just scared of these things. For years, you know, for so many decades, the Simpsons intro had, you know, like a three-eyed fish next to a nuclear plant. And it was just the sort of, became the sort of like thing that everybody knew about nuclear power plants is that radiation will like mutate you and all this stuff. But then, yeah, I mean, like, obviously, nuclear fear of, of nuclear proliferation was, was one thing, because if everybody uses nuclear power, you know, what does that mean for the, what does that mean for the countries that, that don't have nuclear weapons? Are we going to, you know, so are we going to try to restrict, you know, remember that, that, you know, Iran and North Korea started the nuclear weapons programs, nuclear reactors, right? So I, so Teal is absolutely right about that. But then fundamentally, the, the real thing that, that will kill nuclear long-term, not kill it, but just limit it to a niche uh, product is, well, a couple things, cost and cost and cost structure, cost and financing, which are not the same thing. So, so cost is that nuclear power, like mining, doesn't have much of a scaling effect. It, it's it will like, like housing construction, right? So housing construction, we, we've, we haven't really figured out how to make that cheaper over time. And it's because you don't really build housing in a factory. Now you build prefab housing in a factory and we can figure out how to make that cheaper. You can't really build a prefab nuclear plant. Although some people dream of doing that, but then you, you can't, not a, not a big one, maybe a submarine one you can build. But then, but yeah, so, so we don't have much of a scaling effect. Uh, and so that's, that's really going to uh, limit nuclear because, by holding up its costs, right? Like it, 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 nuclear hasn't gotten much cheaper over the years. You know, in the first years when we were learning how to build nuclear plants, it got like a little cheaper over time, but not hugely. And then it started getting more expensive as we started adding more safety features. But then basically we haven't seen, we haven't seen much of a scaling effect from that, much of a learning curve there. And so because of that, I think uh, nuclear will just get lapped by other stuff. Its costs will be exceeded or, or undercut by other stuff. Got it. I, that's a good energy overview. Hey everybody, Eric here with a word from our sponsor. As a developer, the journey from concept to production-ready LLM apps is fraught with challenges. Dealing with unpredictable LLM outputs, correctly handling PII, and ballooning API costs can all be blockers to shipping your next AI-powered feature. Weights and Biases Weave is a lightweight AI developer toolkit designed to simplify your LLM app development. With Weave, you can trace and debug input, metadata, and output with just two lines of code. Weave helps you run rigorous evaluations and securely manage all of your data sets and system configurations so you can focus on what matters most, iterating and improving on your LLM-powered applications. Plus, Weave integrates seamlessly with your favorite APIs and libraries, including OpenAI, Anthropic, Mistral AI, Cohere, Langchain, Llama Index, and more. Make real progress on your LLM development and visit wnb.me slash CR to get started with Weave today. That's wnb.me slash CR. What does the future hold for business? Ask nine experts and you'll get 10 answers. It's a bull market. It's a bear market. Rates will rise or fall. Inflation's up or down. Can someone invent a crystal ball? Until then, over 38,000 businesses have future-proofed their business with NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud ERP, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, and HR into one fluid platform. With one unified business management suite, there's one source of truth, giving you the visibility and control you need to make quick decisions. With real-time insights and forecasting, you're peering into the future with actionable data. When you're closing the books in days, not weeks, you're spending less time looking backwards and more time on what's next. Whether your company is earning millions or even hundreds of millions, NetSuite helps you respond to your immediate challenges and seize your biggest opportunities. 
download the CFO's Guide to AI and Machine Learning for free at netsuite.com slash 102. That's netsuite.com slash 102. netsuite.com slash 102. I want to segue to China and then we'll get into sort of what happened with the, with the, in Springfield last week. So first on China, just if, if, if you guys, so one is Jeff Weinstein asks, I just listened to an episode of Odd Lots that featured Adam Tooze discussing China. Adam has a very different view of China than Noah. I'd love to hear the two of them discuss and debate. Because Adam's not on this conversation, maybe we could high level just share the, where, where you guys differ. Right. I mean, Adam, you know, he's, he's a historian, right? He's, and he's, he's a pretty ideological guy. I think he doesn't like the idea of capitalism. And, all, and, and he does identify capitalism with the United States of America. Actually, interesting, his, his, his grandfather was a Soviet spy. Famous Soviet spy, yeah. Now, I don't think uh, Adam is, a, is, you know, he's in the tank for, for Joseph Stalin here. But, but, but I think that, you know, he, he, he definitely comes from this, this tradition of being skeptical of capitalism, the West, and America in particular is the avatar of capitalism in the West. Uh, and for people who come from that intellectual milieu, there's a, there's a tendency to be very enamored of seeming alternatives, of things that seem to provide an alternative, whether that's, you know, at times that was, some of those people were a little overly enamored of Japan back in, in the day. You know, Japan is obviously amazing. I love Japan and Japan accomplished amazing things, but its economic model has weaknesses that have since been exposed. And at the time, people who wanted to, to criticize America's model in the 70s and 80s and whatnot uh, were a little too enthusiastic about the Japanese model. I think they were a little too enthusiastic about, European, about the European model, uh, especially during the, you know, the 2000s when, when the EU was sort of at its, its apex. I think they were, of course, they were, they were too, too positive about the USSR during its years of fast growth. I think that they're a little too positive about China now. I think that developing countries grow fast, especially when they have a political system that allows them to invest, invest, invest. And, you know, China grew very, very fast, but it didn't really grow faster than like, you know, South Korea or Taiwan or, or Japan. You know, it's, it's a larger country. And so it's impressive that they can mobilize that amount of growth at the level of a huge country, right? It's a little easier uh, when you're, when you're small, but so that's impressive. No one should deny that. But also, if you look at China and say Poland, you know, China grows faster at a percentage rate, but it's a much lower, lower base. And so Poland actually has grown by more dollars of, of GDP since 1991. Then, and so, so which China grew at very high percentage rates from a very low base. China's growth has now slowed, and we don't know if that slowdown will be permanent. And obviously, this is the big question now. But China has slowed to, you know, maybe like 4%-ish growth, I think, trend-wise. I think they, they, they had a recession. Uh, I think they, their growth, they, they, they lied about their growth in 2023 uh, and, and probably 2022 as well. And, then, and they, you know, maybe they're lying this, this year. I'm not sure. But, but that, that's what they do, by the way, that China consistently, they overstate their growth during bad times. And then uh, they sort of save up the, the bullshit points and then spend them down later by, by understating growth during the boom times. Traditionally, that's been what they did. That's called smoothing, right? They'd overstate growth and, and makes it look like the Communist Party is always in control, right? Because it looks like growth is smooth and steady and even instead of a boom and bust cycle. Because you're just, you're just lying. You know, you're lying one way in the bad years and the other way in the good years. But, but over time, as growth slows secularly, you, you can't uh, completely cover this up. And so, and I, so I think that they're slowing toward 4% trend growth. And then that maybe that'll slow to three, you know, next decade, but I think 4%, this, you know, this decade looks, looks about right. And that, you know, when Korea slowed to that rate of growth, they were, you know, something like, I want to say, uh, two thirds of America's GDP per capita and China's at like, you know, one third of our GDP per capita. And so China is slowing down much earlier than, than these other Asian countries did. And you can say, okay, well, that's because they're big. It's hard to grow fast when you're big. Maybe that's true, but it shouldn't necessarily be true because being big means you have a big domestic market and you can grow, you know, you don't need exports as much. You can just export to yourself. 
<laughs> and so, so you don't have to like, like for South Korea or Taiwan, they had to keep depending on exports, even as they got richer and richer, because they were small. They didn't have these big domestic markets. China, I think we're now going to see a lot of the weaknesses of China's system. You know, Tu's came back from his trip to China gushing about the, the modernness of the cities there. You know, everything is big and beautiful and blah, blah, blah. He said, it was kind of funny in his interview. He said, there's so much space. There's all the space in these Chinese cities. It's like, yeah, there's, there's space. China didn't build space. That existed before. You can just pour a large slab of concrete over space. And then like, I'll show you space. It's called a parking lot. It's like, wow, I can move around. It's like, that's, that's an incoherent reason to be impressed with a country, right? I'm impressed. Like if you go to Japan, there's not space. There's density. If you go to Hong Kong, there's not space. There's density. That's impressive in its own way. And so like, the, you know, the, a lot of the, in fact, I think that the Chinese cities are not built on the optimal plan. I think that, that they're too, they're too car centric. And what you get with China, with Chinese urbanism is a pattern development that I don't personally like. It's, you get these, these big apartment blocks, these sort of tower in the park, Soviet style, but nicer. It doesn't, it's, it's more, much more beautiful than the Soviets built. But it's the same pattern of like, you know, courtyards and gigantic high rises just all on their own. Like a housing development is like its own little like city with nothing else. You, you'll have like a noodle shop and a laundromat on the first floor, but not a lot of variety of retail. Right? And then if you want to go to shop or, or offices, of course, but if you want to go to offices or if you want to go to like shop at more, you know, retail with more variety, go out to eat at a nice place or discover interesting stores or whatever, you, you you can take a train, but the, but often you take a car. And so the, the, the highways are just huge, you know, and they, they're just, you, you take a car and you drive to the mall. So it's as if you took Soviet style housing and American style highways and malls and like combined those. So imagine America, but instead of living in a leafy suburb in a single family home, you live in a giant apartment tower block. And then you still, you know, drive on the highway to go to the mall. Like that's what Chinese cities are like. And yeah, there's space and yes, yeah, stuff is new because it just got built. Like people, this, this is a mistake that people make, not just with reference to China, but with reference to everything. Reinforced concrete doesn't like it lasts 50 years. Like reinforced concrete is an amazing building material. You know, you just, you pour it and it goes, and then you have a building, right? You just pour it out. It's, it's amazing building material. Super, super, super cheap, really good at what it does. And it, and it, and it breaks, right? The, the water gets into it and, the, and heat expansion, you know, cracks it. There's, there's like rebar inside and it, it cracks and it breaks and it breaks down over time and paint wears away. Like paint gets worn away by sun and moisture and, you know, oxidation and all kinds of things like that. And, um, you know, grunt, dirt gets on things, right? Dirt blows on your things. And of course, Japan spends a, a lot of its GDP cleaning up the dirt off of things and also limits plants in urban areas, so, you know, so soil in urban areas. So you don't get dirt on things, but then still dirt will get on things eventually. And, and stuff starts to look old, like wait a few decades, wait 20 years, 30 years, and those buildings will start to look old. And you can spend a ton of your GDP constantly tearing them down and rebuilding them. So they always look new, which is what Japan actually does. But like every building Every like, you know, building in America, we think, man, that looks old. That once looked new and nice, right? It's the capital depreciation cycle. And people who, China just exited the biggest real estate boom in human history, the biggest building boom in human history. They built, you know, they would regularly use, this might even still be true, but I, I'm not sure if it's true anymore, but they would, they would use more concrete in like two years than America had used in its entire history. They would just pour that much concrete. And that was, that was why they made so much steel, right? It was to build buildings. It's the, the, the steel that goes inside the reinforced concrete. And so these cities are, are new because they all got built since basically the year 2000. Like in the last 25 years, these, built, these cities were built. And therefore, they all look new. But come back to me in 20 years and they will not look new. And so if you look at Hong Kong, if you look at Taiwan, they look dilapidated as hell, except for the few new buildings that are recently built, right? But everything in Taiwan and Hong Kong that was built in the 70s, like, or 80s, just looks dilapidated as hell now. And that's what will happen 
if you don't spend a ton of money refurbishing or, re or knocking down and rebuilding all these buildings like Japan does and Hong Kong and Taiwan do not like everyone's like, Oh, you know, like, wow, Hong Kong. Yeah. And then they get there. Like, ah, some of this is just falling apart. And that's where China's headed unless they, unless they go the Japan route, which is costly, very costly. And so anyway, the people who are just like mega impressed with, with China aren't necessarily like, some I, I think they got they get caught up in this idea that the West has been surpassed, the romantic notion of the surpassing of the West, which they and their intellectual tradition, you know, which which originally it comes comes from Marxism, but it's not Marxist. Like Tuz is not a Marxist, uh, but then but then I think that a lot of people flocked to who, who flocked to Marxism and to socialism a uh, hundred years ago, when European empires bestrode the globe, right? They they dreamed of this time when the other the other countries would all be equal and then you know the European empires would be broken and that 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 came that happened we're there and and yes that is what it looks like the other you know other countries build new impressive shiny cool things but that doesn't mean that, like but but that that romance of the surpassing of the West is a little too romantic in these people's minds and I think it's a little too romantic in Tuz's mind and and. In that interview, you notice that he talks to to Joe and Tracy about how how Chinese people themselves are very much in the dumps. They're very pessimistic these days, and that's what happens when you get used to a world of, you know, six to ten percent growth, depending on which decade, six percent in the twenty tens, whatever, and then suddenly your growth slows. Right, probably was like a percent and a half last year. And then maybe, you know, I don't know, 3% this year or something. But when you, when you slow down from where you were, and of course, in the 2000s, you were growing at like 10%. When you get those slowdowns, it's like a big shock to your system. When, when all you've ever known was like up, 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 build, build, build. And, and then suddenly nobody's building stuff. And like houses aren't getting built. And like nobody has enough money and people are losing their jobs. You know, they got this big, this big recession. Hey, everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by WorkOS. If you're building a B2B SaaS app, at some point your customers will start asking for enterprise features like SAML authentication, skim provisioning, role-based access control, and audit trails. That's where WorkOS comes in, with easy to use and flexible APIs that help you ship enterprise features on day one without slowing down your core product development. Today, some of the hottest startups in the world are already powered by WorkOS, including ones you probably know, like Perplexity, Vercel, Jasper, and Webflow. WorkOS also provides a generous free tier of up to 1 million monthly active users for user management, making it the perfect authentication and authorization solution for growing companies. It comes standard with rich features like bot protection, MFA, roles and permissions, and more. If you are currently looking to build SSO for your first enterprise customer, you should consider using WorkOS. Integrate in minutes and start shipping enterprise plans today. It relates to a piece you wrote recently where you talked about the two theories for why China's economy is doing badly. Why don't you unpack the, the different in interpretations? Yeah, well, that, that piece was, it was kind of my excuse to try to explain macroeconomics in lay terms. But basically, there's been this debate since the Great Depression. There has been a debate within economics about recessions and what they are. And essentially, one side says, this is a normal part of how economies grow and produce. And it's, and the other, the other side says, no, economies are, a macro economy is a fragile thing that suffers coordination failures and, and breakdown, periodic, you know, just inefficient breakdowns and that needs the government to come in and, and sort of prop things up. And that, those two ideas, and you could call them, you know, Austrian and Keynesian at one point, but, but you could base you could call them like supply and demand based or something like that. Those things, those two basic ideas have been slugging it out for a century now. And so yet in China, the debate's different because China is not fully in sync with American economic thought. I think that the, the, the demand-based explanation of recessions kind of won, at least temporarily in America, because of 2008, because we had this housing bust and a financial crisis and things like that. And it was obviously, it was pretty clear that it wasn't because of productivity declines, you know, it wasn't because of troubles in just one industry. It was really across the board. Everything suffered. And so, so one idea, so, so for example, 
one of the ideas I think that is people have is that recessions are when the economy has to switch from one activity to another, you know, we're like, okay, less housing, more manufacturing. And the idea is that this is hard. The switch is hard. And so you have to basically calculate the, the economy takes a while to switch. And during that time, like stuff gets idled and that's what a recession is. And this is what Ludwig von Mises th thought and, and Friedrich Hayek. These guys really, really thought that. But then what you end up seeing is that even sort of the new sectors. So when you switch from, when you have a demand-based recession, what you see is that even the sectors you're trying to switch toward get depressed for a while. You know, yes, maybe housing went bust and now you're trying to switch to like manufacturing or something, but, but even manufacturing gets depressed. It's not like toothpaste is just being squeezed from like one place to another and it just takes a while to get there. Everything gets to, all, all the sectors get depressed at once. And so the hallmark of like the Keynesian recession is deflation. If you think about it intuitively, here, think about this. If, if productivity goes down, right? If, if something real in the economy happens to make our productivity go down and that causes a recession, sh should stuff get more expensive or less expensive? What do you think? Stuff sh like our, our economy just gets shittier at producing the stuff it produces. We should get more expensive, right? Yeah. Cause like, yeah, exactly. Cause it's more scarce, right? If, if, yeah, if like our factories just stop operating, then, then stuff should get more expensive. But the thing is that in, in a big recession, in almost every big recession that we've ever seen, what happens is that stuff gets less expensive or, or stuff gets, yeah, stuff gets less expensive. Inflation falls def or, or deflation happens. And so that's, that's the hallmark of, of demand going down, right? So suddenly, right, imagine if people want fewer PlayStations, right? The price of PlayStation is gonna go down, right? If PlayStation factories get gummed up, the price will go up because you'd get a shortage, right? You get scarcity. But if, um, but if you know, people just decide, ah, PlayStation sucks, I don't want a PlayStation. Sorry, Sony, I'm using you as an example here. But uh, suppose people decide PlayStation suck, we don't want them. The price of PlayStation go goes down. And similarly, in a demand-based recession, if people decide that they don't want stuff, what they instead want is to sort of save cash under their mattress because either because like they have got a lot of debt they need to pay back or like they're just scared things are going to do badly or because their stocks crashed and they got poor or whatever, or the houses crashed and they got poor or whatever. They get more pessimistic, animal spirits, I don't know, whatever. They just decide, I don't want to buy stuff. I want to save money. Well, then prices of stuff is going to go down. And the fact that we see this deflation or at least heavy disinflation in, uh, in economies in big, in big recessions suggests that we don't see inflation, we see deflation. And so that suggests this is a demand thing. People just don't want to buy stuff. And that's what's happening in China now. You see, you see deflation in China. Yeah. The, there's another China question or that's related to, to Chinese history. Okay, so basically Gihan Bandaraj says that when you're on the neoliberal side of Twitter, there's this kind of simplified idea that it was just Mao's communism holding China back. And it's an economic miracle. The economic miracle is due to Deng's capitalist economic liberalization. Is that fair? Or do you think there was some sort of industrial policy that blunts this narrative? I.e., if Deng had gone full Friedman, would China be even richer than what Xi is trying to attempt with his industrial policy and subsidies? The answer is no. The, actually, China is sort of the purest example of, of you know, Milton Friedman working that we've ever seen. The liberalization of China, like basically until the mid 2000s. So, so, so Barry Naughton has a great book, which is free. It's like a short book, 150 pages or something. It's free to read online. Just look for Barry Naughton, China's Industrial Policy. You can download it as a PDF. He detailed, you know, he's an economic historian and he studies China's industrial policy. That's what he does. And he has an army of Chinese academics helping him, et cetera. But what he showed is that from during Deng, Zhang and, and the first part of Hu Jintao, basically China did no industrial policy at the center. All the policies at the level of China's central government were focused on liberalization, privatizing SOEs, loosening rules on who can own what, just loosen rules and privatize. That's all they really did. But you had a lot of industrial policies going on at the local and provincial level. At the smaller levels of Chinese government, you had these, these tons and tons of policies to encourage businesses. And a lot of what they were doing was encouraging FDI. And this is exactly what you see in America. In America, every state and city is, and, and we call this corporate welfare. We call this pork. 
what it is is industrial policy. It, every state and every city is trying to lure businesses. Everyone wants the factory in their town. Everyone wants the offices in their town. And they're spending money to try, you know, to, to build infrastructure, to build a nice downtown and to build water pipes so you can have all the water for your factory and to build, you know, roads so you can get to the factory and, and you know, whatever. They're competing to build these things. And they're also just, often they just offer cash and they create trade schools to, to, to train local working class people to work in like a little aircraft factory out in some town in South Dakota, right? You see this all over America. Everywhere in America, you see money being spent through universities to have like public private partnership or university private partnerships, research spinoffs, research centers, a million different ways. You see tons of local and state level industrial policies in America. And the same way you see, you saw ton, a ton of this in China under Deng, Zhang, and the first part of Hu. And <clears throat> at the top, all they did was liberalize, basically. Now, around 2006, they start thinking, okay, let's do a national industrial policy too. And then they started shifting, and then under Xi, that, that shift takes off and it really accelerates until we get to where we are now. So China has shifted from local industrial policy. Oh, and now, by the way, the way that they funded all that local industrial policy was with land sales. If they ever had to build the infrastructure or provide incentives, whatever, or cut taxes, you know, they would replace the taxes with land sales. Basically, land sales financed all this local industrial policy. Now, with the real estate crash and the end of this, like, you know, land sales, you can only you can only keep selling land for so long, right? You run out of good land to sell. So, so eventually, you just build all your cities, you develop everything, and then then what? Then you're only selling land people don't want out in the middle of nowhere. You're selling it, and it's much cheaper. And anyway, the. China's reached the end of that model. And so what that means is that now national level industrial policy is gonna become even more important because local industrial policy is kind of collapsing now in China. So, so I, wouldn't, I would say that at the center, they really did Milton Friedman. And the, the central government really just did do the full Friedman. And it was, it was local governments that did the industrial policy. And that's changing now. Do I think this is gonna go well for them? In some ways, yes, in some ways, no. I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's always hard to predict these kind of things, but I think that they're not going to, they're not going to manage to restore rapid productivity growth, but they will manage to get technological edges in certain key technologies that will be very militarily useful. That's my prediction. Got it. Well, that's a, that's a good overview. I want to segue to what happened in Springfield uh, over the past couple of weeks. Of course, uh, Donald Trump in the debate said they're they're uh, referring to the Haitian population. They're eating the cats. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the pets of the people who live there. There were some good memes that came out of it, but of course, when it was you know fact checked or researched, uh, that was not in fact ha happening. There was some disturbance there, but it wasn't. You know, they weren't eating cats. They weren't eating dogs. What, what you you wrote a piece about it. It sparked a broader conversation about you know, immigration and, you know, sort of, why don't you share your, your thoughts? Yeah. So, so this made me really, really mad because essentially it was made up. Let's talk about the ways in which it was made up. Number one, there were no credible reports of pets disappearing, of cats or dogs being eaten by any Haitians in Springfield. When people were pressed to find evidence of this, someone found a psychotic woman who had eaten a cat or was trying, had not eaten it, but was trying to eat it. And she was, you know, mentally disturbed on drugs, like schizophrenic person. And that was not a Haitian. She was just a, you know, American person. And she was, that was far away. I think it was in Columbus. They also found a man carrying goose, which had been a roadkill, roadkill goose. They were hit by someone else's car. He cleaned them off the side of the road. And someone took, and he's just a, he's not a Haitian. He's just a black dude. And he was like, being socially responsible, picking up roadkill to, to, you know, throw it off the road so someone doesn't wipe out and get in a car accident. And someone took a video of him and like, oh, a Haitian with, you know, eating someone's, eating wild animals. Complete bullshit. And then Chris Rufo paid for, paid $5,000 for anyone who could come up with evidence. And they found some video of some unidentified animal being grilled by, I think, some African immigrants, not Haitians, but Africans in some other town in Ohio. And people argue over what those animals are. Was it a chicken? Was it a cat? We don't know. It don't look like no cat to me, but I don't know what it is, honestly. Like, and I'm from Texas. And seeing an unidentified 
you know, animal being grilled on a, on a, on a grill somewhere is not necessarily the most unusual or weird thing for me. Right. I don't think people are going to grill up a cat. By the way, a, 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 a cat carcass is limp. It's floppy. You know, it's, it, it doesn't have legs that stick straight up on you. But, but, you know, it's people, people will shoot and grill up stuff. This is America, you know, like there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hicks and rednecks and whatnot. And people who come from Africa are not necessarily going to be, you know, less hickish than the, than the, than the people in the small towns they move to. They're not going to, they're not going to all be like, you know, if feet, you know, some will, a lot will, will be like, you know, super, super cultured, you know, people with PhDs and whatnot. But you're going to get people like you're going to get some people who shoot a wild animal and grill it in their backyard. Right. You're not supposed to do that. It's against health code. But people do it in a small town in America. This is America. And so anyway, the point is that that was fake. The whole premise that there were 20,000 Haitians that had been dumped on this town was fake for a number of reasons. One reason is that, first of all, there's no there's no central coordinating authority that tells migrants, as they call them, where to go, okay? When people immigrate to America, like they, it, it's all by word of mouth. And so if, if some Haitians get a job at a factory in Springfield, then they call up their cousins who are trying to get out of Haiti and they're like, hey, here's a place you could go and be with us. And so that, this is how like half the towns in the Midwest form. It was just whole towns in Sweden would relocate to Minnesota and just rebuild the whole fucking town in Minnesota. Like that's how whole towns in Czechia, Bohemia, as they called it then, would, would move to Texas. And you just get like a Czech city in Texas where everybody spoke Czech. There was this little town called Snook, Texas that we used to go to for kolaches when I was a kid. There was, you know, just a few miles from my hometown and, and people there were speaking Czech in the nineties. Like, I mean, it's 500 people. It's not whatever. But so, so that, that was sort of just a distortion. You know, it's like, you've dumped 20,000 migrants on this town. Nobody dumped shit. People, you know, word of mouth meant that a bunch of people moved to where they're like, you know, friends and family had moved. That's how migration in America has always actually happened. And so then the other thing was that the 20,000 number, the, the Springfield, the, the county authority said that there were 12 to 15,000 immigrants in the whole county total, right? That's less than 20,000. And that's total. A, that's not the number of Haitians. B, that's not the number of recent arrivals. Okay. When you look at the number of people who recently arrived, when you look at aggregate statistics, we see maybe a few thousand people recently arrived. So maybe a few thousand Haitians recently arrived in Springfield. Now, maybe that seems like a lot. Where do these guys come from? Who are these guys? Like a, a bunch of like French speaking black guys just like show up and start like working at the factory. Like maybe that's disruptive for some people. But overall, the town has welcomed them. Overall, you know, like they, they PBS sent a news crew out and they, the church was like, well, you know what? Nobody was coming to our church. Our pews are empty and, you know, Haitians are, are very Christian. And so suddenly all these Haitians show up coming to church. And now we've got, you know, people in our church. And they were like, well, you know, they're not quite the same people who used to come to this church. But then, but then now we've got, you know, we've got a congregation more. And then, and the factory owner of this metal factory was like, yeah, these guys are great. You know, they don't have drug problems. They show up on time. They work hard. You know, these are not what we call skilled immigrants, but, but not having a drug problem and showing up on time and working hard at a steel factory, that is in some sense a skill. That's something you'd want to positively select for. And now that guy's getting death threats. You know, they've had to like pull all their social media stuff and they, you know, they're like, I don't remember whether they, they paused operations at the actual factory for bomb threats. So, so as a result of, so, so anyway, the whole thing was fucking fake. And then JD Vance got up on CNN in an interview with Dana Bash and said, he said, you know, if, if there's not stories, I have to create stories. What did he mean by that? Did he mean I have to completely lie out my ass? to try to make a point or did he mean nobody cared about this so i brought it to people's attention so that they cared either way you took something that wasn't creating a big problem and you you made everyone think it was a big problem and in doing so what happened well now you're getting bomb threats in that town now you're getting you know threats against the the factory that employed haitians you know these hardworking haitians without the drug problems and the guy was like yeah we like him and and then now the th this is a very republican town 
right? Hey, the Haitians, you know, they can't vote because you're not a citizen, you can't vote. But I'm sure that Haitians before this would have probably been pretty Trumpy, but now not. And so, so now the, you know, there's a very Republican area, but now the, the mayor and the city council who were like completely pro Trump are now like, we, we won't vote for Trump. They said, because he called down the wrath of, of racist assholes on this little town. Like, why would you do that? And then some woman who had like spread some rumor on Facebook about Haitians eating pets. She, she re- like, she apologized and took it back and said it wasn't real. She was just spreading rumors for fun on Facebook. And she's sorry that it went national. If you live in a small town in America, it's boring. It's fun to have intrigue. Like, oh, are they eating the pets? Oh my gosh. You're not going to do anything. You're not going to pick up a gun or join a mob. This isn't the 19th century. But you know, maybe you'll like post some Facebook posts. Oh, are they eating the cats? But then like it blows up in a national thing and you didn't want to act, you didn't want that to actually happen. That, that was not what you wanted to happen. And so she like tearfully apologized for, you know, causing this blah, blah. And so the whole thing was fucking made up. And then Trump repeated it in the debate as if it were a fact, <laughs> you know, they're eating the dog. <laughs> like you lie. He made that up. That is a lie. And so then, you know, Joe Lonsdale who's a guy I know, you know, I have I have actually extensively defended Joe Lonsdale. He he got accused of some false bullshit back in the 2010s, and I defended him vociferously on my blog. And 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 he said, you know what? He 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 said that on Twitter. He said that I was I was being controlled by the Borg, but you know because of my anger about this 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 incident. He said I was being controlled by the Borg, and the truth is that even if this episode didn't actually happen to be true, in general, the next one will. <laughs> This is, this is terrible. I, I cannot understand the morality of this. The idea of inventing and embracing and promoting a fake story, a lie, because you think the lie will draw people's attention to a broader problem. That's immoral. Because, you know, you could have just talked about the broader, what you think of as the broader problem. Instead, you made it about specific people. Imagine that you're a Haitian and you just work at a steel mill. You know, you escaped this violent, anarchic fucking country and you move to work at a steel mill and now you work there, you go to church, you have family, you're like, I'm naked in America, blah, blah, blah. I like my neighbors. Maybe there's one neighbor who's an asshole and says mean things to me because I'm Haitian, but who cares? Whatever. That guy sucks. And so like you're, you're making America. Then one day, like, you know, national politics assholes say some lies about you eating someone's fucking pet. They call you a barbarian. It's basically like a blood libel. You know, you've heard of blood libel? Yeah, so it's about Jews eating Christian babies for Passover. You know, this is this is not quite that bad of a libel, like eating pets, but it's, it's you know, it's sort of similar, like, they're a bunch of barbarians. It's kind of thing, right? Like, so now someone calls, someone just lies, makes up some lies for political purposes, calls you a barbarian, and now you're getting bomb threats from just like out-of-town asshole, you know, groipers on the internet or like, you know, whatever. You didn't deserve that. You did not. Des- you are an individual person who came to America to make it, and you're just doing what's right by you and your family. You're doing everything right, and sudden and and now, like, like some whole political movement is after your ass just because you exist, just because they think that by going after you and making you a target, they can make some broader point about immigration in America and immigration policy that they don't like. They're using you as the as the sort of target of hate that's not that's immoral that is just that's that's a moral stain if you if you've participated in this and done this if you have knowingly embraced false rumors about specific real individuals in order to make a broader political point you have committed a moral sin i don't know how to say it like that's bad people should be judged on their individual merits and they should not be targeted for being part of a group. That's just basic Americanness. And churches in Springfield are like, they're, they're sending messages of support to the Haitians, you know, in, in the community and saying like, Jesus loves you. And so I love to see stuff like that. You know, that's, that's classic, like small town America. And if you see that, you see that across America, you see this, this, this sort of healthy behavior at the local level. It's the national political stuff driven by social media and the na- and national political movements that creates insanity. And we, of course, we've seen it on the left. You know, we've seen like Palestine protesters just harassing random Jews. In Iran. I hate that, you know, just to like make a point about Israel. 
That's like the same thing. But then, but then the Democrats marginalized those people. They kicked them out of the DNC and basically completely ignored them and didn't even let them speak, which that's great. Good job, Democrats. In Republicans, it's the guy at the top. It's Trump doing this because I think he's sort of flailing. You know, he hasn't got quite the juice that he used to have. And Kamala's doing all right in the polls and like whatever. And he's just this old, old, angry guy with nothing to lose. And, you know, and then there's J.D. Vance, who doesn't really know what he's doing. You know, he's just like he's too online. J.D. Vance is too fucking online. He thinks that like. The, the sort of rabble rousing that you do on Twitter to get a Twitter mob is okay to get is okay to do to get like a real mob in, in the real world where people get real bomb threats. Like, no, it's not, bro. Like, this is not your stupid little Twitter war where lol, nothing matters. This is not 4chan. This is real. And so I, I think that he's just too goddamn online. And, and, and Trump is just this angry old guy who doesn't give a shit and just rages and rages against stuff. He's just looking for the next thing to rage against. Right. And so, and is they're eating the pets. And so like, so, so I hate this. This is just the least American thing I could imagine. This is like, you know, it's, it's like, what would Ronald Reagan do? This is the exact opposite of what Ronald Reagan would do. And, you know, I said, you know, I, I've been saying nice things about Reagan for years now. I wrote a post about for, for Bloomberg about how good, about how Reagan is totally underrated. Nobody read it because it was Bloomberg. And then, then I, I wrote some tweets two years ago, 2022, about how like Reagan's underrated. And then all the like liberals and progressives and everybody just, just screamed at me. This guy, this, this historian dude, um, Eric, well, what's that guy's name? I forget that. The, he was like, can we cancel this motherfucker now? It's like, oh yeah, you wrote about your post. Yeah. It's, it's like this guy, people just screamed at me for saying Reagan was underrated, for praising Reagan. And you know what? All those people can kiss my butt because I'm right. And I tweeted that. I tweeted, you know, just, just today. I tweeted like Reagan is underrated and all those people can kiss my butt. And Elon was like, yes, I really miss Reagan, blah, blah, blah. Well, how about supporting some Republicans who, who are like Reagan instead of some Republicans who, who spit on everything Reagan held dear and did? Like, how about that? How, you know, like if... Elon, I think, now actually probably legitimately has some real power in the conservative movement, the Republican Party. I wouldn't have said that three years ago. I would have said he's just some dude. But like now, I think he actually has some power through control of Twitter, but also just because he's you know a rich guy that people listen to. And I think, why not use all your money and your influence to steer the Republican Party back toward Reaganism instead of this weird, you know, like they're eating the pets bullshit. Like, you know... Anyway, I, it just, I just, at, at, at some point, you know, like I, I, I just get morally outraged about this kind of stuff. Well, even if you are concerned about immigration or the effects of these populations on, on these small towns, going about it this way is, is not the right way to do it and not, not the effective way to do it because you lose whatever credibility you had because you start with a, a falsehood. There's, there's definitely ways. I mean, like, if you, you know, I, I am an advocate of, of closing the asylum loophole. So we stop getting this flood of, of asylum seekers illegally crossing the border. These Haitians didn't do that. At first they were saying the Haitians, they called them illegals. Trump called the Haitians 20,000 illegals. You know, he said, these Haitians are all legal. They're under something called temporary protected status. They're basically, it's, it's one of these like programs, basically a refugee program. We let people in. They didn't cross the border illegally. They didn't sneak in. They're not those guys. Those guys, there are a lot of those guys. And I say, cut them off, cut those guys off. Stop those guys from being able, to, there's even Haitians trying to do this. They go to Mexico, they come through the, the Southern border. Stop, cut that off. Stop that. Just boot them right out. Don't give them an asylum hearing. Make people, you know, apply at a port of entry in an orderly way. Follow the rules, wait in line for asylum, blah, blah, blah. Do all that stuff. Okay. Do that. And in fact, that's what Biden is now doing after delaying too many years, right? He, he delayed two years too long, but he's finally doing this. And that's what Trump did during his first term. You can do that. And, you know, it will, in the long term, it will require a legal change to close the asylum loophole. But I'm all in favor of that. But here's the thing. Americans, whatever, Americans' opinion of immigration and their opinions of immigrants are different. Americans often, Americans hate illegal immigration. They don't like the, the national will being, being violated. They don't like our national borders 
and our national sovereignty being violated by people who just break our rules and then get rewarded for that. They don't like that, you know, but when you talk about the actual people who live here, especially the people who came here legally and are living here, you know, who immigrated legally uh, like the Haitians did and just came when they were allowed to come, you see very few Americans who will turn against those people. And in, you know, Im anti-immigration sentiment has surged so much under Biden because Biden failed to do enough fast enough about the border. It's surged so much that I think the Trump people and a lot of people have forgotten how pro-immigrant sentiment was during the Trump years. We saw an unprecedented outpouring of pro-immigrant sentiment under Trump the first time. Why? Because it seemed like Trump was trying to persecute immigrants themselves. And Americans don't necessarily like immigration, but immigrants themselves, they do like. I think Trump forgot that. He miscalculated and he went after some people he shouldn't have gone after. I think that's a good good way to way, way to close. I want to be mindful of uh, of time. Is there anything on, on the topic that we we haven't yet got to, or should we wrap on that? No, I think let's wrap on that. That's 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 pretty much the clearest I can say. Like you know, whatever whatever you think of the process of immigration, when you go after immigrants as like a as a group of people, then then you're asking for trouble um, because you've gone against one of the fundamental precepts of America. And I think Americans will stand up for and defend that idea of America as the country of immigrants, even if they don't like the way that some immigrants are coming now. Yeah. Well, no, this was a great uh, and very efficient and effective conversation on fracking, China, and immigration. As always, uh, great conversation. Until next time. Until next time. Econ 102 is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen, In the Arena, The Cognitive Revolution, and more. If you like what you hear, subscribe and leave us a review in the App Store. You can keep up with both of our Substacks for written analysis of the topics we cover in the show at noahopinion.substack.com and erictornberg.substack.com. Thanks for listening.